Hello everyone and welcome back to my career mode let's play slash tutorial in Kerbal Space Program 1.4.1 and in this episode we begin by getting a explore the moon contract and it just asks us to fly by the moon so that's fairly simple but of course uh, there are some tricks to it especially since we haven't unlocked patched conics yet and I'll try and show you how to do it without unlocking patched conics first uh, since at least the moon doesn't require it and so it's good to know how to take care of that uh, in the more early on sort of way, just in case. Just in case for some reason you haven't gotten enough funds to unlock the patch conics yet. Um, other than that, I don't see anything. It's all these testing things and observational survey things. Um, heat shield and flight over Kerbin might be interesting. I, I don't like it. It's not paying enough anyway. Okay, so the question is, do we need more technology? Should we unlock the... Well, we can't unlock the tracking station upgrade yet, because it requires 300,000. But we do have some science here. Should we unlock some more parts? Well, the heat shield would probably be advisable returning from the moon. Maybe not necessary, but advisable. Um, it gives us another scientific instrument, the barometer. There's a service bay, though I don't imagine we'll be using that right now. Uh, another consideration is the radial decoupler, which allows you to have boosters on the side of the rocket instead of in line. So far we've been building straight rockets, but we could add boosters to the side, which is handy, so our rocket doesn't like end up like this tiny little pencil straight up and then, you know, risking wobblies and stuff like that. Much more of a risk in earlier versions of Kerbal Space Program than this one, it seems. Um, it might be good to get this fuel tank because well uh, we have a part count, count limit we've got a limit of 30 parts to our vessels and right now we've got a lot of little fuel tanks this will cut down on our part count but I think the heat shield is most necessary so I'll go this way okay and actually well we could get another one let's do the part count reduction and get this fuel tank I think that's probably for the best also, it gives us this larger solid rocket booster, but right now we don't have radial decouplers, uh, though there are tricks to making sort of radial decouplers. I don't think I'm going to get into those tricks. Uh, they, they involve those modular girder segments that we saw before, like I was attaching the parachute to in the previous, well, in the, the first episode. So, yeah, general rocketry it is. Okay, so in this episode, we're going to get into doing science, as it were. Not just the crew reports and all that, but using these scientific instruments under the category science. The question is maintaining balance. I want to put these goo containers, and I guess we should have two. And putting them radially like this, you have to tuck them in. At least I, I want to tuck them in because I don't want them looking like they're poking out so much. And so what you do is you click there, make sure you're on uh, off of snap and then you move it in now you can reach it but it doesn't look so bad and I think I'll put the thermometer and barometer at the bottom here okay now the topic of action groups actually you know what um, it looks like the th thermometer and barometer are sticking out more than this now there we go we probably don't need all the ablator on it that's for more serious re-entries like from interplanetary journeys Let's cut it down by half. Well, in order to do all the science, it would be nice to have the action groups, but it seems like, I, I forget, I thought in the settings I had action groups activated automatically in the difficulty settings, but apparently not. If you did have action groups enabled, you'd have another icon up here, but it doesn't seem like I have that icon, so I guess I did not pick that option to have action groups enabled by default. So, in order to get the action groups, we will have to upgrade the VAB. Once we get action groups, what we'll do is make sure all these sciences can be toggled by the same key, which would be a lot easier than right-clicking on all of them individually. Uh, though, I often just right-click on them individually anyway. Okay, once we put a decoupler on here, we get this shroud. I don't like the shroud, so I'm going to turn off the shroud. And I'm going to use number two and moving this up to set it like that and I feel like that looks better so our original tanks contained 0.5 tons of fuel uh, these new tanks contain one ton of fuel exactly 
and so easy to calculate as far as uh, your you know engineer report calculations are concerned how much fuel you have this engine this reliant engine has more thrust at sea level uh, better performance at sea level but it doesn't have gimbling so that's its downside. It is lighter than the LVT45, the one that we have already used. But so more thrust, more efficiency at sea level, weighs less, but no gimbling. And so this one, more efficient in vacuum, has gimbling, weighs more. So that's the difference between the two. Uh, the Thumper is sort of interesting. It's got better uh, ISP than these boosters, thankfully but it's obviously still not up to par with the liquid engines. It's got 6.15 tons of fuel inside, and that means that the structure plus the engine is 1.5 tons. So it's, it's getting up there as far as its dead weight. All right, so I've sold for a sort of an overburdened LVT45 swivel stage in that um, we are carrying 10 tons of fuel instead of uh, the optimal six for this stage and instead uh, having just a hammer booster down here. Uh, as far as Delta V is concerned, it'd probably be better to use the Reliant engine on a second stage at the bottom, but that would cost more. And I'm trying to see whether this cheaper version, be cheaper because the SRB is cheaper, uh, would be preferable. Uh, the LVT45 can lift all of this fuel. After all, if we take off the decoupler, uh, we see that the mass is 14 tons, and the swivel engine at sea level has 16.7 tons, or 16.8 roughly, of, uh, of lift capacity. And of course, we're not going to be at sea level when we light it, because the booster is going to bring us up a bit. So, yeah, um, it can lift that much, but it's not the best thing in the world. And the reason we're doing it this way is because of our limitations right now, especially the mass limitation. I think it would be prudent on this first try to maybe not go with the goo containers. The goo containers, these guys, uh, yes, lots of extra science and all, uh, but, you know, 0.05 tons doesn't sound like much, but when the capsule itself is 0.84, that's more than 10% additional mass. So let's uh, just leave that off for now. We do want to get to the moon. That's important. And, you know, I don't have any Kerbal Engineer. And I'm, I'm only doing very rough calculations right now. I, really, I'm just trying to shove as much together that will fit under the 18 ton mass limit here. And I could, if I, like, reduce the weight of this heat shield by dropping a blader, maybe sneak one more tank on. I don't know, let's see. Nope, up point oh five. I mean, I'd have to dump... Uh, wait, I've already taken out the mod propellant from there. I'd have to keep it to 20 ablator. I think on the first try we'll see exactly how much ablator uh, goes off and then judge from there whether we could sneak another tank on. But this is prob it'd probably be safer to bump that up again. But the ablator does have mass, obviously. And the total heat shield mass is 0.3. The ablator is 0.2 of that. So the lowest mass you can get it to is 0.1. And if I do it halfway, that means the mass of this heat shield is 0.2. But anyway, I think this is our, going to be our first try for the moon. And I forget whose turn it is, but Jeb snuck in first, so we'll let Jeb go. Okay. Let's see what happens. Ooh, stormy sort of night skies going on here. Um, we don't have fins on, and this SRB does not have any gimbling. So we're going to be just trying to hold it steady for the first bit of it. And interestingly, these aren't lit up. But I guess maybe that's because we're not in flight? I'm not sure. Okay, or oh, we don't have a prograde vector, probably. Now, the nice thing about the moon is it's equatorial. It doesn't have any inclination. It's not, an, unlike Mimus, Mimus you can see is in somewhat of an inclined orbit, but 
The moon is directly equatorial and we're launching from an equatorial location. So as long as we go 90 degrees, we'll be directly in line with the moon. So good times, here we go. This engine is barely able to get us off the ground. The flame effects are a little bit weird here. Okay, now I'm gonna turn. So initially we're just going into a regular old orbit. A uh, nice low orbit would be fine, just above 70 kilometers is sufficient. I can let Jeb hold prograde here. But you have to make sure you start it out properly though. I would like to do stability assist here, we're pitching down a little bit too quickly. 45 degrees at 15 kilometers is sort of a important benchmark for me. Once we are in orbit, we are going to calculate whether we can get to the moon. Okay, that's good enough. So the rule for getting to the moon, assuming that you do not have um, patch conics enabled, is to start heading for the moon when it's right above the horizon, which... Um, well, it's a little bit far away from the horizon right now. But once it starts peaking above the horizon is when you should transfer to the moon. That's not a general rule for planets or moons and, um, you know, in general. It just happens to be the case for this moon around Kerbin. And we're getting a little bit lopsided. I don't mind dipping into the atmosphere a little bit. Let's say 65 kilometers, but yeah, that apoapsis is getting a little bit high right now. Okay, so the question is, can we transfer over to the moon? I doubt it, honestly, right now. Let's see. So we've got 83 units of liquid fuel. And in one ton of fuel, you end up with 90 units of liquid fuel. So 83 divided by 90 tells me that I have 0.922 tons of fuel. So again, I just take, or you could add these up and divide by 200. It would get you the same thing. But I just use the liquid fuel as a benchmark and say 83 divided by 90 tells me how many tons of fuel I have. Well, what's the mass of the vessel? Mass of the vessel is 4.82. Okay, so I take 4.82 divided by 4.82 minus the 0.922. So I'm taking the mass with the fuel and dividing it by the mass without the fuel. Since the fuel is 0.922 to get the mass without the fuel, I take 4.82 and subtract 0.922 from it. So it, uh, basically it is 4.82 divided by 3.9. And the answer is 1.23. Then hopefully you have a calculator that has an LN button. That's natural log. And... Uh, I think Windows, the scientific calculator mode on Windows will have it. And so, or you could just type it into Google, actually. If you just type in into Google LN of 1.2365 or whatever you got with the previous calculation, the answer is 0.212. And then we multiply it by 9.81 and then the ISP of the engine. In this case, 320 we get an answer of 666 meters per second. And I'm just going to tell you outright that to get to the moon, you need between 800 and 900, usually closer to 800. But uh, 900 is good buffer for these missions. So we do not have enough to go to the moon. But we do have enough to try for a high orbit bit of science. Also, we have other science to do. So let's do the other science. We've got a barometer here, log pressure data. Now, transmitting the data takes electric charge. So, hmm, do I want to, and we don't have a connection anyway. Let's just keep that. Maybe we should just do some data here. Keep that data. And then we'll do a crew report in high orbit. So we'll use the fuel. High orbit is above I think 240 or 250 kilometers. So we're going to at our periapsis, which is the best place to lift our apoapsis, which is already high. 
Now our periapsis is inside the atmosphere technically, so it's causing a bit of drag, but not a whole lot. We're going to boost our orbit up. Pay attention. Okay, how about 2000? Okay. Now, can I transmit the science safely? Because I want to transmit the science because then it'll clear it out for the high orbit science, so that would be nice. Oh, right, I don't have any antennae on here. I have to get used to that because the in Realism Overhaul, which is a set of mods, uh, the pods all have antennae, so you don't have to always add one. Okay, so now let's do a crew report. Keep experiment. We're high over Kerbin. And then at our apoapsis, we'll bring our periapsis down to make sure that we re-enter. And you'll notice why I was worried about the electric charge because uh, the electric charge is used for the reaction wheel. We do not want to deplete it by transmitting the science because in that case we might not have very much control. Though the engine does replenish it somewhat. Gonna bring it down to let's say 25-26 kilometers and then once we get closer to Kerbin we'll separate that off. So the equation to calculate the delta V on a rocket is called the rocket equation and I'll well I mean you can look it up but basically it's 9.81 times the ISP of the engine and then times the LN of the mass with fuel divided by the mass without fuel. Well we definitely used more than 20 units of ablator so that is not an option. So I guess the other option for us right now, assuming we don't unlock any new engines, is a shorter upper stage and extended lower stage. Which might be good. That means that we won't be carrying so much mass to the moon with us. Right now we were carrying a very large body with us to the moon and that's not the best thing. It looks like our blader diminished by about 33-34 units. Possibly that means that 50 units is good enough for the moon, but it's not clear. Sorry for coming back down in the night time. We did get a world's first milestone because we reached high orbit for the first time. So we're short about 240 meters per second of delta V. Which is not much considering our launcher has about 4,000 or so. We still don't have the ability to EVA the Kerbals, otherwise that would get us a lot of science. And we've already done the basic science on the water, so let's just recover. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm playing somewhat of a gambit here. Um, quite, quite a risky endeavor. But I've decided that the best way to go about this is to have two LVT-30s, which are the engines that don't have the gimbling, but they do have the better sea level ISP, they're lighter, and they have more thrust. Uh, so on the first stage definitely we'll get off the ground a little bit faster and more efficiently. The second stage though is the toss-up, and I decided to go with it because it was lighter, and I think if Obviously, if our command pod's reaction wheel is powerful enough to control the rocket when we're on the first stage without gimbling, you'll definitely be able to control it when we're on the second stage without gimbling. But still, it's it's a, it's a huge question mark altogether. So, yeah, I, I'm just pondering this. We've got 5 tons of fuel up here, and then 7.5 tons here uh, to bring our mass pretty close to the 18 ton limit, as close as I can get right now. I've reduced the ablator on the pod here to 60 units and well it's gonna be close it's gonna be close uh, what I'm most worried about is like crashing into the moon leaving the Kerbal in orbit uh, you know and having to rescue the Kerbal that's that's par for the course really but 
crashing into the moon accidentally would be a problem. And the reason we would crash into the moon accidentally is because we don't have the tracking station upgrade yet, and we can't see our resulting orbit around the moon, right? We see our trajectory around Kerbin, and that we're headed towards the moon, but we don't see what happens once we get into the moon's sphere of influence, so we don't know if we crash into it. Uh, and uh, we might not have enough fuel to correct that situation. That's the problem, basically. So, with that <laughs> ominous note, let's try this. And uh, we'll send Val. And we'll see what happens. Uh, but I feel like this is a good situation to, to introduce quick saving and quick loading. Uh, here, let's launch. So, yeah. Quick saving. F5 is quick saving. Uh, quick loading is F9. Also, there's an Alt F5. And so if you wanted to um, save it for a particular reason, just in case Val crashes into the moon, you can save it like that. And then you can Alt F9 and select which, which save you want. And the persistent file is the one that gets automatically saved all the time uh, at every scene change. And the quick save is the one I got with just pressing F5. But then we've also got this special save here. Okay, so SAS is on, throttle up, and here we go. Now this engine had a, a thrust of 20.5 tons, you can see there. Actually, let's pin that to see when we get a specific impulse at our peak. What is, uh, when do we get to 310, which is the best this can do. And the vessel mass is 18 tons, that's why we're getting off the ground very slowly. And of course, we only have the reaction wheels in the pod controlling the rocket, so we have to be careful. Make sure we're pointed at that prograde vector so we don't flip. Flipping it doesn't seem as much of a problem here as I remember it being in stock. But I'm just going to have Val hold the prograde vector. And that'll keep things steady, especially through the staging. You can see we're at 287 now. So really, for most of the launch, we're mostly interested in the vacuum ISP. You can see we're getting close to the vacuum ISP pretty quickly. We've already got to 300 there at about 9 kilometers. And for most intents and purposes, we're within 1% of the maximum ISP. So, yeah. Gives you an idea. Oh, we don't need that one anymore. And this one, 310 is the max, so we've basically reached it. Let's see how our orbit is shaping. Let's stop the engine there. And timing-wise, the moon is on the opposite side of the planet, so we're definitely not going to be burning straight for it. This is still not an optimal trajectory, but you saw the flame effects there, so we're, we're encountering quite a lot of drag as it is. So, I mean, we would like to be shallower, but it's probably not feasible. Now, if you want a nice circular orbit, if the apoapsis is going behind you, you tilt up. If your apoapsis is going ahead of you, you tilt down. So here, the apoapsis is going behind me, so I'm going to tilt up a bit. And that'll bring it over to me. Don't overdo it, though. Because it's inefficient if you do that. Anytime you're tilting away from the prograde vector, it's going to be a bit inefficient. Okay, uh, that's good enough. 76 by 83. Now let's assess how much fuel we have and how much delta V we have. Remember it takes 800 to 900 to get to the moon. So I'm going to do the math. I mean, you don't have to do the math. Uh, you can just use my example for instance. The amount of fuel we have is 1.2 tons. I took 108 divided by 90. So 1.2 tons. Our dry mass is 4. Point, let's say 4.2 to give ourselves some buffer. So 4.2 tons divided by 3 tons because uh, 4.2 minus 1.2 is 3. 
and then ln of that number multiplied by 9.81 times the ISP of this engine which is 310. We've got 1023 meters per second. Now that's enough to get to the moon. I don't know about safely but we can we can transfer there. There it is. Okay, point prograde. And ignition. I'll keep it moderate. We don't need to overdo it. And we can see our orbit going out. Note that we're not headed towards the moon there. We're headed towards where the moon will be once we get over there. That's the that's the trick of it. Do not try and point at the moon, uh, at planetary bodies or anything you're trying to rendezvous with it normally. Um, because we're really trying to get the orbit over, like, there. Okay, so now we've got a little tangency to the moon's orbit. The moon says it's at an altitude of 11,400 kilometers. And so we'll just go a little bit above that. Okay, so let's head out there. So as we go out, of course, we slow down. You can see we're slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. And that allows the moon to catch up. And then right about there, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Okay, so now we're crashing into the moon. <laughs> this is not good. This is not good at all. Uh, so, what we would like to do is burn away from the moon. This little vector here is called the radial in, and as it implies, it will get us mm, closer to the moon right now. We only really, really use the radial vectors, the little blue ones, when we are approaching a body, when we just enter the SOI. And what we want right now is to go away from it because we're crashing into it. So we're going to use this one. And, and as you can see, this corrects our orbit so that hopefully we get a periapsis. There we go. Now we want a little bit higher than that. Okay, so now we have a periapsis. But we've got another problem. We don't know how exactly we're going out into Kerbin orbit after this, right? Are we going to be encountering the atmosphere of Kerbin? That would be good, actually. We want to. Uh, but we could, I mean, uh, with certain passes around the moon, we might end up on escape. So generally, I don't advise that you make a rocket like I have done here. I advise that you get more science first. Use the goo containers and all that maybe do the launch pad signs and maybe some of the other contracts before you try for the moon and unlock instead the LV-909 engine which I'll show you later on and we'll do another moon mission which is a little bit safer this was not a safe mission this was a very very tight margin mission but it does allow us to get a crew report here and that's about all the signs that we can well that and the thermometer barometer is all we're gonna get we could get the close to the moon science, but I'll save that for later. I think this should be enough to get us to the LV-909, we'll see. Okay, so we are we have a close pass to the moon, but we're not really going to be able to keep that science because right now our instruments are filled and we have no way of transmitting that information back. So we'll just pass on by this very close encounter with the moon the currently dark side of the moon if you will and we won't really know what's going to happen in Kerbin orbit until we get out of here that will change once we upgrade the tracking station Okay, well, that's a pain of an orbit, isn't it? So, we, we would be stranded right now. This kicked us up to a high orbit, and this periapsis is way too high to come back down. What we want to do is, well, if we want to bring the periapsis down, we should do that at our apoapsis. So, let's go out to our apoapsis and see if we have enough fuel to do that. I don't know. Right now, it is a mystery. Right now, we're actually poised to maybe... No, no, not really. We wouldn't be encountering Minmus at all. But if you're wondering, of course, it is possible to transfer from the moon to Minmus. That is a thing that can be done. 
not helpful in our current situation. So here at our apoapsis, is it possible to bring our orbit down sufficiently so that we can save Val? Note that the velocity here is 204 meters per second, which is not much. And as far as our remaining delta V, we probably have something like 100 or so. Let's see. So we're bringing our orbit down. You can see we're slowing our orbit down while we do this. Ooh, look at it, it's so tight. Uh, nope, 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 Val is stranded. Ah, so we're going to have to rescue Val. It was very close, very close, but not close enough. So Val is stranded here, and we're going to have to mount a rescue mission at some point. But probably not right now, because we only have pods that can fit one Kerbal. We could, you know, put two pods together and all, but it would be tough for such a pod to rendezvous with something like this. This is going to be a tough rendezvous, and might be the subject of a how to rendezvous thing. Uh, I think that would be interesting, but let's get some more technology first. Val has found, well, we only got 33.6 science? Oh right, we have to recover the science. Hmm. Darn it, Val, we have to recover the science for us to have enough science points to actually rescue you. This is a problem. Hmm. Well, we'll do some other science. Let's, let's do the other science that I would have suggested you do uh, before launching a moon mission so that we have the science to rescue Val. I think that's going to be in a different episode though. So we'll leave it here with Val stranded in space around Kerbin, having flown by the moon at least. We did unlock that. We probably got some funds for, uh, oh, and we got the contract fulfilled. We did get some funds because we'll first milestone this and all of that. But, but yeah, Val's in a bit of a trouble. So with that being our cliffhanger, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.